hurting, groaning world. If you don't believe that, just think about in Knoxville. Every day on the news, there are killings that take place in our city. In the city of Chicago alone, over the Thanksgiving weekend this last year, there were 61 shootings, and nine of those were fatal. Abortion is on the run and rampant. This is hard to believe, but since Roe versus Wade in 1973, there has been 58 million 586,256 abortions in this country. Did you hear that? Over 58 million children died at the hands of an abortionist. In 2013, in that one year, there were 664,400 and 35 babies killed through abortion one year. The world is groaning. It's groaning because of divorce, the breakup of the family, because of child abuse, spousal abuse, the abuse of sex, the abuse of drugs. We could go on with a host of other things, you know why it's groaning? It groans because of sin and the effects that it has upon mankind. There are inevitable disappointments in this life. I don't know if you've noticed that or not. Sheila Walsh used to be a host on um, uh, 700 Club. You now see her once in a while, quite often, in fact, on James Roberson's uh, program. While at the 700 Club, she received a letter from a lady <clears throat> in her mid-twenties. This lady had cancer and multiple cirrhosis. She said this in the letter, Sometimes I watch your program and I'm helped greatly. Sometimes I want to take off my shoe and throw it through the screen. She was fascinated by her honesty and made contact with her, and they became friends. And one day she said to Sheila, one of the things that I hate about what you do is that you always present people whose marriages get fixed in 10 minutes. People get healed. People who have nice packaged answers. And then she said, what about people like me? who are dying and still love God? What about people who take very few steps in life, but every step they take leaves a deep impression in the snow because it took every ounce of strength they had to make that step? Sheila said, she changed my perspective about life, about Christianity. Christianity is not this nice, everything's going to work out and be okay kind of a thing. When you think of Christ at the tomb of Lazarus, the Bible says he wept. He wept, I believe, because things were not supposed to be as they were. For see, he had spoken a beautiful world into existence. It was a magnificent world that he brought into existence. It wasn't broken, it wasn't messed up, but now Jesus looked at the world and he saw how broken it was and how messed up it was, and death was not supposed to be part of that process. One of the greatest gifts that you can give is just a dose of reality that life down here does have disappointments, we don't have all the answers, but I can assure you of this. God always gives us himself in the midst of the mess. Amen. It's a fact of life. We live in a hurting world. Let's read verses 18 through 23 of Romans 8. 
I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that was, will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage of decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruit of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons the redemption of our bodies. And, and so we see in this passage there is frustration in our world. Frustration is the word used in verse 20. It means emptiness, purposelessness, vanity. The whole book of Ecclesiastes is written and the author keeps saying over and over again, everything is futile, everything is vanity. The writer says, meaningless, meaningless, everything is meaningless. Vanity, vanity, all is vanity. Chuck Swindoll points out in his study on Ecclesiastes that in chapter 2, that chapter is filled with myself, I, me, and mine. One of the reasons that there is so much fr frustration in this life today is that we are centered around ourselves. We live in an entitlement age right now. I don't want the millennials in here to throw stones at me because not everybody fits into this category, but not only millennials, but we are in an age where everybody expects the government to take care of them. We want the government to give us things. We want that cell phone. We want that whatever it is, we want it. And we keep focusing on ourselves, and when we do, there is an emptiness that comes into our life. There is a frustration that we feel, and we feel empty. The futility of frustration about life is summed up in verse 24 in three, 21 in three words, bondage to decay. And so there is a continuous cycle, isn't there? There's birth, there's growth, there's death, decomposition, decom decomposition, and the whole process of deterioration in the universe is happening, and it seems to break down. Paul describes it as suffering in this present age, as futility, decay, and pain in this passage, and he will compare that this world, he'll compare that world to the future glory that you and I as believers will have in Christ Jesus. The creation is groaning. It's groaning to be released from all the decay and the pain and the suffering. And we know there is suffering in our world. And we are grateful that the present suffering of this present age is only temporary. And it will lead to a future glory for us. This is stretched, stressed in each of the verses that we've read to you and some of the others we have not read yet. The sufferings of life are not meaningless, folks. What's the purpose of it? They're preparing us for an eternal glory with the Father. So suffering is an ever-present problem. Babies are born, unfortunately, with deformities and other problems. Farmers plant their seed in hopes of a great harvest, and maybe there's a drought and they don't get very much or they get nothing out of that year. Innocent children suffer because of the sins of parents and others around them. A good person dies at an early age while uh, a scoundrel seems to just go on and live forever. And the big question that we ask in all of that is why? Why? And I can tell you this. Majority of people and even Christians at times blame God. It's God's fault. 
How many times have you ever heard somebody say it's Satan's fault? It's God's fault. I'm going to turn against God because he did this to me. Let me share something with you. If you look at the book of Genesis, chapter 1, it says that God made a beautiful and perfect world. And every day he looked back and he said, his creation said, it is good. It is good. You need to listen to this. When God created the world and he finished it all, he said, it is good. Now, the last part of creation was man. God took a big chance when he created a man. Every woman says amen to that. He gave him the ability to think. He gave him the ability to determine his own choices in life. He gave him the ability to, to direct his own way in life. And in Genesis chapter 3, mankind sinned and caused corruption and caused a curse not only to come upon the man and woman themselves, but upon the whole earth. So after that time, there were thorns and there were thistles, there was earthquakes and there were tornadoes. There was suffering of every kind that brought devastation. H.B. London was pastoring in Los Angeles, California at the time. Later he worked for Focus on the Family and he uh, served pastors in that capacity. I was fortunate to hear him a couple of times. While he was pastoring in Los Angeles, he stood helplessly beside Dave and Jana. The doctor came into the room and said, I'm so sorry. Your baby has died of sudden Infant death syndrome. He said, I watched that young couple's shoulders shake as they held their baby, their firstborn, for the last time. He said, my mind was racing about what am I going to say to this young couple? I, I've been there. <laughs> what do you say to this young couple? What do you say to this family? How do you deal with it? He wanted to say to them, you know, everything's going to be okay. But it wasn't going to be okay. It wasn't. And all of your pastoral training, and all of your pastoral experiences kind of seemed to leave you at that time. You just stand there. What in the world do I say to this couple, this family? Here's what he said. Dave and Jenna, I don't know why this awful loss has come into your life. But I do know that God loves you with an everlasting love. I know that God cares about you and loves you more than he loves, as much as he loves anybody on the earth. If you accept his love, you'll be okay. If you don't accept his love, you will not. And those were the only words he said I, I, I could speak. And he said, that after I said them, they seemed so empty. Man, I've been there. Why wasn't I smarter to say something better than that? Something happened, he said, in that hospital room. Neither the couple nor H.B. had words to erase the pain they were feeling. But he said the holy presence of God invaded that room. And like he was with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace, we sensed his presence with us in that room in the fiery trial that we were having. And he said, uh, there was no satisfactory answer to the why question. He said one day after he had left that pastorate and been over to uh, focus on the family in, in Denver, he got a letter from Dave and Jana had a picture in it. HB, they said, you probably don't think we heard you when you spoke to us about God's love and how he loved us more than anything else in the world. So we've believed over and over again that God loves us. 
And there have been times that we have quoted what you said to us, to each other. And said, the Lord has been gracious to us. Notice in the picture, the letter said, we're holding a brand new beautiful baby. We don't understand why God took from us our first little child. But we do know that God loves us and we don't question him anymore. H.B. said, some tough situations are mysterious beyond all comparison. Greater than our answers, they stretch our faith. And if we allow it to happen, it turns us more and more to God. There is suffering in our world, folk. But in our text, we have a hope in our hurting world. Aren't you glad of that? We have a hope in our hurting world. We look for hope in our hurting, and we look for hope beyond our hurting world. Let's read together verse 24 and 25. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what he already has? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. Hope is the ingredient that helps us accept the trials of life and get beyond them. It is not the way we deal with our human situation that gives us hope. Did you hear that? It's not the way we deal with them that gives us hope. It's hope that helps us to deal with our human situations. Two men can be in the same room looking out a bar, say in a jail. One sees only mud and the other sees stars. So friend, when you say that a situation is hopeless, we are slamming the door in the face of God. No situation is ever hopeless. So when you become discouraged from suffering, when your life looks entirely dark and bleak, when you begin to feel that your plans have failed and things aren't going the way you want them to go, never give up hope. Never. A number of years ago in a mental institution in Boston, there was a little girl named Little Annie. Little Annie was put down in a dungeon, dungeon down in the basement in a cage. The doctor says she was hopelessly insane. And so in that little cage, she was going to spend her life till she died with very little light and no hope. About that time, an elderly nurse was uh, about to retire, and she believed that every person had hope. All of God's children had hope. So she began taking her lunch down into the dungeon, and she would sit outside the cage that little Annie was in. Didn't even seem as though Annie recognized she was there. In many ways, little Annie was like an animal. On some occasions, when people would go into her cage to minister to her, she would attack him. In other times, she would be completely, kind of ignore the fact that they were even there. When this elderly nurse started visiting her, little Annie gave really no indications that she even recognized that she was there. And then... Uh, she began to take uh, on, once a week uh, some brownies and she set them down on the floor just outside the cage. And he didn't pay any attention to it. But the next Thursday, when she came back, they were gone. She came faithfully to sit at Annie's cage. And one day, the doctor began to notice a change. And then one day the doctor said, you know, I think we can take Annie upstairs. 
And then the day finally came when they said to little Annie, little Annie, you can go home. And she didn't want to go. She said, I want to stay here and help people like myself. So she stayed. She was the one who ministered to Helen Keller, and her name was Ann Sullivan. Hope? You better believe it. There is hope in our hurting world, but the believer, for the believer, there is a greater hope in this hurting world because one day we get to leave this hurting place and go into an eternal resting place where there is no pain, there's no crying, nothing is going to be hurting us there. Before we left today, I listened just briefly to the pastor of Severe Heights, Severe Heights Baptist Church. I couldn't believe he was almost preaching my sermon. We hadn't collaborated. I was listening to Ravi as I came to church, and he was talking about the same kinds of things. There is an eternal hope for us as believers. Listen to what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16 through 18. Therefore, do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we're being renewed day by day. For our light momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes, not on what's seen, but what is unseen? For what is seen is temporary, and what is unseen is eternal. Right. Hmm. So in our hurting world, we need to look to the Spirit to help us in our weaknesses. Uh, let's go back and read Romans 8, 26 and 27, the passage just right after what we read a moment ago. It says, in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. The groaning and suffering world puts us in a place of weakness, doesn't it? It's difficult for us to admit our weaknesses, and yet we all have them. God is concerned about the trials of his people. When he came to Moses in the desert, he says, I have seen the sufferings of my people, and I am going to deliver them. <clears throat> the Holy Spirit feels the hurting of our weaknesses, he feels our sufferings. And at times we are so weak in our faith that you may not know how to pray. You don't know whether you are to ask for a change in the circumstances or if the Lord would help you through the circumstances. You just don't know how to pray. And it is then, the Bible tells us, that the Spirit of God intercedes on our behalf. He searches our heart. He searches the mind of God. He then prays for us in accordance to God's will for our life. And you can't get any better than that. He prays for us when we may not know how to intercede for ourselves. Marge and I were in Cameroon, Africa. I've been there once. Don't really care to go again. I was to travel to the northern part of the country and stay overnight. I was to meet with the group of people that we were considering to bring into the Church of God. Uh, it was a horrible trip, horrible trip. Uh, we were in a little uh, probably seven or eight passenger minivan. We probably had 15 people in it. And the odor wasn't pleasant. And there were no food stops. 
When you stop for bathroom break, break, men on one side, women on the other side. I mean, it was a wonderful trip. The president of the missionary board was just flying in first class. Right. Had nothing to eat all day. Had people waiting for me at 7 o'clock that night. I didn't get there till midnight because of this wonderful trip. At one point, we had to get out and push the bus up a hill. I got into the room, and the lights were on, and I looked to see that the room was acceptable. Not always acceptable, but this one was. Sharps know exactly what I'm talking about. I no sooner seen the room and the lights went out. And as they know, in Africa, when the lights go out, it's dark. <laughs> it's pitch black. There are no street lights. I had a little flashlight, thank goodness. I went in and met with the people. I had had nothing to eat all day. They brought me some popcorn in a can or a dish or something, and I, I was eating the popcorn as I talked to the people that I could not see. I couldn't see even any white teeth or shiny eyes. It was dark. And then we left. I put my flashlight up because I was filthy dirty from the dust and junk of traveling. Put my light up in a shower room, took a bath, went to bed. Could not go to sleep because I was deeply impressed to pray for Marge that I left back in this minus five star hotel. I didn't know what the problem was, but I, I, I began to earnestly pray for her. I mean, I earnestly prayed for her. Took me a while to get back home the next day. When I got home, I had discovered that that night someone broke into our room. I had gone down to the bank to cash a thousand, get a thousand dollars out for my regional director to go over to Nigeria. They thought that was in my room, I'm sure. And I was gone, they knew that, and so they had someone breaking into the room. As his foot came through the window, she finally got the door open and ran down to another lady who was with our trip and locked that door. She was so disappointed, all of her candy bars were taken. <laughs> they thought it was film for the camera that they took. Um, Here's the point. God impressed me to do that. And this passage is saying that that is the work of the Holy Spirit. He knows our needs. He knows what our problems are. He knows what our frustrations are, what our suffering is. And he prays for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. There is hope for you and me in our suffering world. So whatever your hurting place may be today, God understands it. And he'll make a way for you when there seems to be no way. Several years ago, Dr. Charles Stanley said that he was struggling with some real serious problems and opposition in his congregation. One day, an elderly lady invited him to come to her a uh, place where she was staying to have a meal with her in the cafeteria. He said, I was very busy. I was under serious, serious pressure. I really did not want to go, but I went. And after they had had dinner, she said, I want you to come up to my apartment. I want to show you something. And hanging on the living room wall was a picture of Daniel in the lion's den. And she said, Pastor, I, I want you to tell me what you see in that picture. So he began, well, I, I see that uh, some of the lions are lying down. Their mouth is closed. I see that uh, Daniel has his hands behind his back and he's looking up. She said, I want you to understand something. Now, here's what I want you to see in that picture. Notice that Daniel is not looking at the lions. He's looking at the Lord. My friends, put your trust in him. Put your trust in him.
Sometimes it's hard for us to admit that we have a need in our life, that we're hurting. Friends, God knows every need that you have. He wants to meet them. Some of you are passing through some real tough storms. Remember, He makes a way for us. When it seems the load gets heavy, He's no doubt helping you carry that load. And if you want to pray today about a need that you have in your life, about a problem you're facing, about a suffering you're having, you're welcome to come and pray. If you do not know Jesus Christ as your Savior, I invite you to come and receive Him as your Lord and Savior. So we sing it again. God will make a way when there seems to be no way. He works in ways we cannot see. He will make a way for me. He will be my guide. Hold me closely to his side. With love and strength for each new day. He will make a way. God will make a way. If you believe that, say amen. Father, we thank you that we serve an almighty God who doesn't always take the pain away, but helps us through the pain and suffering. Sometimes you remove it. Sometimes he says, you say, you need to go through it. Sometimes you lead us around it, but Lord, you are the one that we turn to in those difficult times. Father, today especially be with those who are hurting and have special needs. And as we go forth, may we be hope in this world, in this community, for you. In Jesus' name, amen.